Reading comes to us from the 13th chapter of Mark. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1, and I'm going to read on through verse 8. Let's listen now for the word of God. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when, this, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Thus ends this. But the reading and the hearing of this, God's holy word, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When writing a sermon, as you've heard many times, I utilize a list that's called the Revised Common Lectionary. It's a list composed by scholars that gives the suggested biblical passages for each week. The passage listed for today is the one we have in front of us. Mark 13, 1 through 8. Sometime right around Advent, this passage is almost always on the lec lectionary. This passage has an apocalyptic flavor to it, and it's usually preached that way. It seems to me that the scholars want us to receive the message that something is about to happen right before Advent. Things are about to change. They're going to be different than they were before. And God is about to make all things new. It's a good message to have right before Advent. Today, however, I want to suggest a different interpretation, a new interpretation. I want to suggest there's a different way to look at this passage. And I want to suggest that the disciples wrongly are focusing on things other than God. Let's listen to the first part of this passage with fresh ears. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign that these things will be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. And they will lead many astray. Now, I could go on and describe the signs of the apocalypse. I could talk about the fire and the smoke and the earthquake. But instead, I want to focus on this one sentence, this one phrase. Beware that no one leads you astray. Because it seems to me that we're very often in danger of being led astray. Oftentimes, we're in danger of being led astray in subtle ways, ways that we don't even recognize until it's too late. We could interpret this passage simply as a warning against the lure of cults, for example. But for most of us, we're in very little danger of being lured by a cult. We could take it as a warning against false prophecy, but very few of us, I suspect, are in danger of being lured away by false prophets. However, I think we are in constant danger of being tempted away from the kingdom. 
of being led astray from God's call. It isn't obvious the dangers that are out there that threaten to ensnare us. It's the subtle ones, the ones that kind of sneak up on you like a thief in the night. Any way that you look at things, I've been a pastor for more than two decades. During that time, I've been in contact with hundreds, perhaps thousands of Christians, hundreds of churches. And one thing I can tell you with an absolute certainty, every person I've ever met is a sinner. And every church I've ever been in is full of sinners. And I'm one of them. I'm one of them. We're all tempted to stray from the message of the kingdom at some point. And we do it more than once in our lives. So we all have to be constantly on guard to see that we're not led astray. Now, I submit to you that the biggest danger that the disciples faced on that hill that day was not that they might identify a false messiah and follow the wrong person. The biggest danger was that they might buy into the ways of the world and be led astray by them. I think that's also the biggest danger that faces us because I think it's the biggest danger that faces every person throughout history. It's easy to be subtly led away from the kingdom of God. We're often led astray by the ways of the world. We have to keep constant vigilance in order to prevent ourselves from being led astray by the world's false values, false ethics, and false morals. I liken it to driving a car. The other day, uh, we were, Barbara and I were out in Jones Valley And we were in a parking lot. We were leaving the parking lot. And Barbara said, you are about to run a stop sign. Stop. Okay. I allowed myself to start daydreaming while I was behind the wheel. Not good, folks. Don't do that, by the way. If you're you're driving a car, please pay attention. Don't do, do as I say, not as I do. Right. Okay. That's the problem with our faith. We put our faith on autopilot. We don't pay attention to what we're doing and we can get led astray. Okay? As I was writing this sermon, one incident from my history came back to haunt me. When I was pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, we received a grant for $20,000 from a nonprofit foundation. We received that grant because one of our elders served on the board of that foundation. He had the idea that we could redecorate our conference room with some of the money. And he envisioned spending maybe $5,000 on that project. Perhaps the additional money could be used for other projects at the church or perhaps some for benevolence. I suggested they consider a playground. However, as so often happens, the project grew. And by the time it was presented to the session, nearly all of the $20,000 was spent to redecorate one room. Unlike this church, in that church, very little money was designated for benevolence of any sort. There was very little thought given to serving others. Now, lest you think I'm being too hard on the members of that church, I really don't blame them. The members of that congregation were good people. They were hardworking individuals, paid their taxes. Individually, many of them gave their money and their time to others generously. They were good Christians. They loved Jesus Christ. But as a church, I believe they'd gone astray. I believe that they had bought into a false set of values. The value of believing that that which is pretty is by definition holy. It's time, I think, that we begin to focus on the values of the kingdom 
I'll let you in on a little secret. That's why I came to Jesus. For those values that are expressed in this book. It's also why I went into the ministry. To help people focus on those values. I didn't come for the beauty of the worship service. I came because I needed to deepen my relationship with Jesus Christ. The only person in all of the universe and all of history who could save me from my sin. I got into the church because I wanted to help people do the same thing. I got into the church because I wanted to spread the love of Christ. I got into the church because I wanted to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, to preach a gospel of forgiveness, and to make disciples for Jesus Christ. And my biggest frustration is that I feel that the church often gets sidetracked from those values. We set those values aside to concentrate on other things. If you want to know what I think is the secret to thriving as a church, I think it's for us to place those values at the very center of our lives. I think every minute that we spend focusing on the things of the world is a minute wasted. That's a minute we could have been doing something else, something that really is holy. Now, we've just come through a very difficult time in this world we're, we're coming out of a worldwide pandemic. We can look at what happened the past year as a setback. Or we can look at what happened as an opportunity. I think we should do the latter. I've been talking with the session after the first of the year. I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to start a discipleship group here at Copeland. It's one of the things that I'm wanting to do as we start to go back to normalcy. I want to ask you to ask yourself a question. Ask yourself if you're satisfied with your relationship to Jesus Christ. If the answer is no, this discipleship group might be for you. Looking back at the text, it's important to realize that for the ancient Jewish people, the temple was the most important place in the world. The temple was God's house in a way that it really never has been for Christians. For us, the church is God's house in a metaphorical sense, but the ancient Jews believed that God really lived there. That in some way that humans can't really understand, the temple was a middle ground between two worlds the natural and supernatural worlds. It was a portal between two dimensions. God dwelt there in order to have dominion over both worlds. And if one wanted to meet God, one went to the temple because that's where God was, literally. The trouble with that was that people began to revere the temple rather than the God who lived there. They began to consider the temple holy rather than the God who lived within it. So it's understandable that the disciples would talk about the beauty of the temple. Jesus, however, redirects their attention towards himself. Now, we Christians have always said in our theology that we can find God anywhere because we believe that God is everywhere. We don't have to go to a special place to find God. We don't need a temple. We have the Holy Spirit. For us, this is who God is. A God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Immortal. Omnipotent. Omnipresent. The building we happen to inhabit matters little. It's simply a, a home base from which we can conduct our mission as Jesus Christ's servants. We can find God wherever we are because God is everywhere. However, however many people we happen to have, 
We can do God's mission because we do so within the power of God himself. However much cash we have on hand will be enough to do whatever it is that God wants us to do. To me, it isn't a question of what we have that's important. It's a question of what we do with what we have that's important. Over the next few months, I'm going to begin asking some questions about our spirituality, and I'll ask them often. I will ask questions like I just asked. Are you satisfied with your relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you want a better relationship with Christ? Are you willing to put your faith, your faith, on project status? Again, if the answer to any of these questions is yes, the discipleship group might be for you. Now, I've been here at this church for almost 15 years. I've gotten to know each and every one of you. Each one of you is special to me in your own way. I believe that each one of you is a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe firmly that each one of you has a purpose in the kingdom of God. A reason that God called you into being and called you here. That there is some purpose that God has for you. Some cause that you were meant to serve. And I believe that of the people who are watching me here on this phone as well. I can't tell you what that cause is. But I know that you have it. And I know that God gave you the gifts you need to fulfill it. God loves you. God has a plan for you. You are an important part of what God is doing in this world. And I ask only that you allow me to help you seek that purpose. And I pray that God will continue to bless you as you develop a closer relationship with him and a greater life of kingdom service. Just don't let anyone lead you astray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.